Hello, everyone. Greetings from Istanbul. As the secretary of the Center for Ottoman Malay World Studies at Fatih Sultan Mehmet Vakıf University in Istanbul, Turkey, we have a distinguished guest today. I am honored to introduce one of the leading scholars in the field of Malay studies, Dr. Annabel Gallo. She is the head of the Southeast Asia section at the British Library. And also in 2019, she was elected as a fellow in the British Academy. Her main research interests are Malay manuscripts, letters, documents, seals, and the art of beautifying, decorative elements, and art of illumination in these manuscripts. She has many published work in this field, and her most recent work, and perhaps her masterpiece, is Malay Seals from the Islamic World of Southeast Asia, published by National University of Singapore Press in 2019. She is currently continuing her research in the Quranic manuscripts and often shares her experience in, the, in her Twitter account and enables us to follow her progress. Digitization of the manuscripts is also another work she is carrying out and it is also an important service and contribution to the academic memory of the Malay studies. Today, she will tell us the story of Hajj, the pilgrimage from Southeast Asia through these manuscripts and also the Ottoman artistic influence on these manuscripts. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Gelov. Now we are all listening to you. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction, Mr. Kopp, and I'm absolutely delighted to be talking and joining you at OSMAD today. I'm going to share um, my screen. So there, I hope you can see that now. Yes. So um, as announced earlier, my talk is on the Hajj from Southeast Asia. But what I'm not going to be doing today is giving you a full history of the Hajj, the pilgrimage from Southeast Asia, because as Mr. Kopp explained, my field is manuscripts and other cultural objects from the Malay world. Um, and I study them in order to see what they can tell us about the cultures that created them. And as I was working on this topic of the Hajj from Southeast Asia, I realized that for much of the period for which we have sources documenting the pilgrimage, in fact, the holy cities of Mecca and Medina were under Ottoman control following the defeat of the Mamluks in 1517. And so I entitled my talk today, The Hajj from Southeast Asia, A Story in Sources from Ottoman Times. But I'm going to start with the very earliest times and my narrative will be embedded in sources, in written sources, such as inscriptions, books, documents, and seals, and other cultural artifacts, which testify to the long history of the pilgrimage to Mecca from the Malay maritime world of Southeast Asia. But at the end of my talk, I will also consider Ottoman influence on Malay manuscript art. So these prospective pilgrims in Loksamawe, Aceh, photographed in 2013, are practicing the tawaf or circumambulation of, the, of a model of the Kaaba, and they're preparing for a journey which nowadays only takes a matter of hours or at the most a few days in an aeroplane. And in fact, Indonesia, is the country which sends the largest number of pilgrims to Mecca from any country in the world on the annual Hajj, with many more coming from the other countries of Southeast Asia, including Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei, and the Philippines. So pilgrims have always undertaken the Hajj from Southeast Asia over the centuries, albeit not in such large numbers as nowadays, because they had to travel further and far longer than pilgrims from almost anywhere else on the globe. As evoked by the title of a recent book um, on the Hajj from Southeast Asia by Eric Tagliacozzo, entitled The Longest Journey. Now it's difficult to say when the Hajj began from Southeast Asia because there are so few sources from the early period, but there were probably Muslims living and trading in Southeast Asia from the very earliest days of Islam and proof of this very early Arab presence in Southeast Asia came with the discovery in 2000 um, and sorry, came with the discovery um, in 1998 of the Bulitung shipwreck, 
This was a shipwreck off the coast of Belitung, the island of Belitung in Sumatra, of a 9th century Arab ship, a dhow, which was made of wood, which has been carbon dated and um, assigned to Oman or that region, which was carrying a cargo of tongue, ceramics and other treasures back to the Middle East from China. The find comprised the largest collection of Tang wares, which is now held outside China, and it's currently on display in the Asian Civilizations Museum in Singapore. But the existence of this trade network means that there must have been small communities of Muslims living all over Southeast Asia for many centuries, for merchants would have needed to wait for many months for the monsoon winds to change for their return journeys back westwards across the Indian Ocean. But the main wave of Islamization in Southeast Asia is generally marked or judged by the with the institutionalization of the faith, which came about with the conversion of kings or rulers of states. And this process started in the 13th century, not surprisingly, on the northern tip of the island of Sumatra, which is the area which is most the westernmost part of the archipelago and the part closest to the Middle East and India. So the wave spread eastwards over across the archipelago um, with the kingdoms of South Sulawesi becoming the, probably the last bastion um, to convert to Islam in, about, in the early 17th century. And the earliest material witnesses to the Islamization of the region are inscriptions on stone, which are nearly always tombstones. But in fact, the earliest inscription on stone is not a tombstone. It's a very well known, um, very large inscription from Tringanu on the east coast of Sumatra. It's generally referred to as the Tringanu stone. And it was issued by a local ruler setting out Islamic laws and it's written in the Malay language, written in Arabic script. And it's the earliest known inscription in Arabic script, which was produced in Southeast Asia. But we know absolutely nothing of the polity or the ruler that produced this stone. We do know rather more um, about the kingdoms in North Sumatra, including the earliest kingdom known to have converted to Islam, Pasai in North Sumatra because they have a very rich tr tradition of funerary monuments, tombstones, many of them with inscriptions, but these inscriptions are nearly always completely in Arabic without any elements in Malay. And there are e examples of exceptional beauty. Um, these stones are normally called Batu Aceh or Acheni stones, but they vary in shape and it's possible to tell the evolution um, in shape over centuries and hence to date them, sometimes just from the iconography alone. These Batu Ache were are undoubtedly of local manufacture, but in North Sumatra, you also find large numbers of intricately carved tombstones of Kambe marble and workmanship, which were brought from Gujarat in India. These have been studied by Elizabeth Lamborn, who in 2003 documented at least 15 of these tombs in Aceh in North Sumatra and three at Gresik in, um, on the north coast of Java. And in fact, this is the largest existing corpus of Gujarati tombstones, Kambe tombstones in the world, because those in Gujarat itself have generally been dismantled and reused as building materials over the centuries. Now, as you can probably tell from the quality of these black and white photographs, these tombstones were photographed and documented in Dutch colonial times, but there are still many other gravestones in Aceh which are hardly known or documented. Luckily, there's a very active group of local historians in Aceh called Mapesa, this is Masharakat Paduli Sajara Aceh, who salvage, document and study these tombstones. And you can see the conditions in which they have to work. Um, Aceh is a region which is very susceptible to environmental damage and disasters, such as the devastating tsunami of 2004, which completely um, destroyed and changed parts of the coastline 
and actually um, inundated many, many graveyards. Um, so I asked one of my colleagues who works with this group, Arya Purbaya, if he could let me know of the earliest um, indication of the title Haji, indicating a pilgrim found engraved on a tombstone. And he informed me um, that Mapesa, the group Mapesa, had recently discovered a local tombstone dated 1460, so in the mid 15th century, in Gampong Blangpa in Ache Uttara, northern Ache, which recorded the death of someone called Haji Izudin. And in fact, it's a very clearly um, engraved um, tombstone. You can see very clearly his name, Haji Izudin, in the top line. Bin Ibn Haji, um, um, bin Haji Ismail, but his name continues um, Amir Abadi. So in fact, although this is the tombstone of a Haji, um, someone who had performed the pilgrimage, whose father had also performed the pilgrimage, he was actually not a local, but from Amir Abad in Iran near Hormuz. So this is the earliest known tombstone made in Aceh of a Haji, but it's not of a local. However, there is another tombstone, which is, although it's undated, it can be dated stylistically to the 16th century. And this is of a man whose name is Abdullah, and he has the Malay title Sri Maharaja Leila. But according to the Arabic inscription on his tombstone, he seems to have been the official in charge of the Hajj and maritime matters. So that implies that in the 16th century, the pilgrimage from Aceh was already institutionalized and organized enough to have necessitated the creation of a post of an official who was in charge of regulating it, which gives us some indication of the, um, of the number of, of pilgrims departing regularly from Aceh. I'd now like to turn from tombstones to written evidence of the Hajj. But of course, with it the, its tr tropical climate and frequent um, floods and fires, it's difficult to find manuscripts in Southeast Asia that date much earlier than the 16th century. However, we do have later manuscripts which preserve earlier compositions. And through careful philological study of these manuscripts, we can evaluate and, and date these sometimes much earlier texts. Now, in my study for written sources from Southeast Asia on the Hajj pilgrimage, I was very lucky that an extensive study had already been um, carried out by my colleague Henri Chamberlois, who in 2013, with the um, collaboration of a large number of scholars, published a three volume compilation of Malay and other Indonesian accounts of the Hajj pilgrimage dating from 1482 to 1890, with a really masterly and wide ranging introduction, which looked not only at accounts of the Hajj itself, but also at references to and views about Mecca as the holy city and the center of the Muslim world. So from um, Chambert Loire's survey, it appears that the earliest known Malay account of the Hajj is found in one of the most famous Malay tales, the Hikayat Hang Tua, the story of Hang Tua, who was the Malay admiral of the 15th century kingdom of Malacca, which at the time was the greatest Malay sultanate and the richest port in the whole of Southeast Asia. So Hang Tua is the, the Malay culture hero. He's an exemplary warrior who is um, renowned for his um, loyalty to the king, and he combines the style and panache of other epic figures such as Rustam or, or Rollo or, or Lancelot in the English tradition. Now, Malacca was, of course, captured by the Portuguese in 1511. And the Hikayat Hang Tua is believed to have been composed about two centuries later in Johor in the 17th century to try and evoke and capture the splendor of Malacca and to perpetuate the memory of its greatness. It was a very popular tale and over 30 manuscripts are known, but most of these date from the 19th century. I think there might be one from the 18th or, or possibly the 17th century. 
And in this story, Hung Tua is asked by his master, the Sultan of Malacca, to lead a delegation to Rum. Rum is, of course, the Malay word for the Ottoman kingdom, so the Ottoman Empire, and in this case, the Ottoman capital of Istanbul or Constantinople is known in Malay sources as Rum. Now, at this po point, I, at, I should point at point out this juncture. I should point out that um, to read the Hikayat Hung Tu, Hikayat Hung Tu, like any other epic, um, should be approached with keenly critical faculties. Uh, at the time of its composition in the 17th century, Johor's great rival was Aceh, and Johor very much resented the fact that Aceh would not help it and assist in yet another assault on Portuguese-held Malacca, um, because Aceh had in fact already attacked Malacca twice and, and had suffered you know, major defeat in the, early, in the early 17th century. And Johor wanted Aceh to join with it again in another um, attack on, um, on Malacca. And at that point, Aceh held back. And so um, the literary scholar Vladimir Braginsky has proposed that the account of Hung Tua's journey to Rum in the Hikayat Hung Tua is actually a very brazen borrowing, or you could say appropriation, by Johor of the various Achenese embassies directly to Istanbul, to, um, to the Ottoman world in the 16th century. So it's been, so the Achenese experience has been transplanted into a Johor Malay story of Malacca. So to return to the Hikayat Hung Tua, so on Hung Tua's voyage to Rum, he travels up the Red Sea in his boat and stops at Jeddah. And since it happens to be the right time for the Hajj, he is invited by the governor of Jeddah to perform the Hajj, which he duly does. And a detailed description in the Malay story follows of all the Hajj rituals, including at the end, the replacement of the kiswa, the curtains um, and, um, surrounding the, the Kaaba. And the old kiswa is divided up for sale and Hung Tua himself buys a piece, which is the largest piece he, he, he could get. So it says, Maka Laksamana Pun Mamblila Tira Itu Barang Sedapatnya. And this in the Hikayat Hang Tua, this Hajj episode is dated very precisely 9th of Zul Hijjah 886, equivalent to the 29th of January 1482. But this is the only date in the entire large Hikayat. And for this and other reasons, including some errors and omissions in the description of the Hajj rituals, um, Chambre Loire is convinced that this entire episode is another interpolation into the story um, and that it has been inserted into the Hikayat Hang Tua to enhance the Islamic credentials of the epic. But this insertion itself, even though it might not be, might not have been created by the author of the Hikayat Hang Tua, it's an original account in itself of the Hajj in 1482, which either would have been written originally in Malay or translated from Arabic. So this episode is in itself of great interest as a very early account of the Hajj linked to the Malay world. So in Chamberlois survey of references to the Hajj in Malay and other sources, including in, in Javanese and other languages, he quickly identifies a rather strange ambivalence because on the one hand, in all the royal chronicles, whether it's Hikayat Raja Pasai, Sujara Malayu, or tales like Hikayat Hang Tua, there is fulsome praise paid to Mukha as the great source of Islamic authority. So it's the, the Sharif of Mukha from whom opinions are sought um, at the, and the great authorities of Islamic reasoning are always held to be in Mukha. On the other hand, there is no direct evidence or even interest shown in these chronicles by local rulers of undertaking the Hajj themselves. Now, the most usual reason cited is the long time taken and how long they would need to be away from the throne, which might not be securely held in the meantime. However, at the same time, in the 15th century, on five occasions, the Sultan of Malacca traveled to China to pay tribute to the Chinese emperor. And these are, were also very long journeys, but no Sultan of Malacca ever undertook the Hajj. 
So Jean Belois has traced a number of formal justifications in Malay texts for rulers not undertaking the Hajj. Um, one very famous text is the Tajus Salatin or Crown of Kings, which is a, a mirror for princes based on Persian and Arabic models, which was composed in Aceh in 1603. And in this work, in a chapter on justice, a devout king announces to his ministers that he would like to undertake the Hajj. However, his ministers beg him not to go. Instead, they tell him that there is a pious Haji in the country who has lived in Mecca for many years and has brought back with him the benefit of 60 Hajj pilgrimages. And they suggest that the king could simply buy the benefit of one of these pilgrimages from the Haji. So the king goes to see the Haji and tries to buy a Hajj pilgrimage benefit from him. But the Haji tells him that despite his riches, he will never be able to afford to buy one of these pilgrimages unless he treats one single man in his kingdom with justice and leaves him satisfied. And in that case, the king will have earned the right to buy all the 60 pilgrimages many times over. And so the message in this text is clear that the role of the king in dispensing justice at home to his subjects is more important than the undertaking of the Hajj. However, if Malay sultans themselves did not undertake the Hajj, many others from Southeast Asia did, and the biggest group were Islamic scholars and intellectuals from every island in the archipelago who flocked to the holy cities of the Hijaz to study Islam. Now, these scholars came from all over the archipelago, from all these different islands, Sumatra, Java, Borneo, Kalimantan, Sulawesi, Mindanao and Sulu, speaking a wide range of different languages from Achinese, Minangkabau, Sunnanese, Madurese, Wolio, in Ton, um, even um, Taosug in the Sulu Islands. But they were united through their use of the Malay language. They could That was used as the language of the whole of this region for purposes of trade, for purposes of diplomacy and communication, and crucially for the spreading of Islam in Southeast Asia. And so that is very much why we, and this is um, a map, the map that I'm showing here is um, perfectly entitled, A Map of the Countries Wherein the Malayu Language is Spoken. It's from the first Malay English dictionary published in London in 1701. And this is what we call the Malay world of Southeast Asia. So when these um, Islamic scholars came, traveled to Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, when they arrived there, they were called in Arabic the Jawa, after the island of Java. But the name, the, the Jawa, was applied to all, it came to, it took on a generic meaning of all Muslims from Southeast Asia. And so the nisbah or name element al-Jawi um, came to be applied to all the resident Southeast Asians in Mecca and the Arabian Peninsula. And their language was termed Bahasa Jawi or the Jawi language, meaning the Malay language. And many of these scholars spent long periods, decades in um, the holy cities studying Islam before returning to their um, to their home islands to to pass on their teachings to other people. And this, um, this network has been studied by um, Azimardi Azra and other stories and other scholars who talked about this Jaringan Ulama, so this network of scholars, particularly in the 17th and 18th centuries. One of the most prominent of such scholars was um, from Aceh Abdurrauf of Sinkil, who spent nearly 40 years in Mecca and Medina, also studying in the Yemen, before finally returning to Aceh to take up his post as the chief um, spiritual authority in the kingdom during the reign of um, the first queen, Sultana Tajul Alam. And he wrote many works, including this work um, shown here on Fiqh, the Mirat Atulab. But he was also, he's most famous because he wrote the first Malay commentary, um, a complete commentary on the Quran. And he was also renowned because he had an assistant um, whose name was, um, we don't know much about him except for his name, Baba Daud al-Rumi. And 
from that name, we assume that he had Ottoman blood or his forebears came from the Ottoman realm. So again, a clear marker of Ottoman links with the Malay world during that time. Another very famous scholar from Southeast Asia who also spent um, at least two decades in, in Mecca and Medina and also traveled as far as to Damascus and to the Yemen for his study of Islam was Sheikh Yusuf, um, originally from Makassar. Um, when he returned from the Middle East to Southeast Asia, he, sta he sta took up a post in Banten as advisor to the Sultan of Banten but he was, um, during the war with the Dutch, he was captured and exiled first to Sri Lanka and then to the Cape in South Africa. And he is really credited with developing Islam in South Africa. But the important thing here is his seal, um, which, is, um, which is inscribed very clearly, Sheikh Al-Hajj, Yusuf Al-Taj. Al-Taj refers to his um, Sufi title, Al-Tajul Khawati. So he was... Um, granted the title by his um, master in the um, in the Halwatiya Tariqat, um, which he um, he obtained the Ijaza, the certificate of that in Damascus. But this is the earliest seal. It's dated um, 1088, 1677. It's the earliest Malay seal with the title Haji on it. So it's a real marker that he, we don't always hear from these scholars that they performed the pilgrimage while they were studying in, in, the whole, in the holy cities. But we assume, of course, that they must have. And we have proof on Sheikh Yusuf's seal that he certainly had performed the pilgrimage. Um, so the scholars undertook the pilgrimage. We don't have evidence that the rulers did. But even if the rulers did not undertake the pilgrimage, their courts were important centers of dissemination of information um, about the situation in the holy cities and prospective pilgrims would usually request permission from the ruler to undertake the Hajj. So this is the personal diary of the Sultan of Bone in South Sulawesi, Ahmad Asale Shamsuddin, which is written in Bugis language and script. The Bugis tradition of keeping court diaries, which is an exceptional historical resource that we don't find in other um, Malay world kingdoms, it probably started under European influence, probably from the Portuguese or the, proper, the arrival of the Portuguese. So the solar calendar, the Gregorian calendar, is used rather than the Hitra calendar. So you can see that these pages are for 1782 um, for the months of January and February. But something which I've only more recently realized is um, a very strange, again, Ottoman influence that the Ottoman Rumi calendar is used for the names of the month. So here we have um, Kanunisani for the first month and um, and Subat for the second month. So rather than the Hitra months, um, the, the the names of the um, the Muslim months, um, we have the Ottoman names um, used, which must imply a degree of um, of Ottoman administrative and um, organizational influence in the court of Bone at that time. So these Bugis court diaries are set out like an office diary with one page per month, one line for each day of the month. But if you had a very busy day, um, the writing would have to go up in a spiral, as you can see, like a labyrinth to use the um, amount of space available. So some days were quite quiet, but other days were extremely busy. And in an entry in this diary for May 1780, we find that on the 17th of the month, um, a note from, from the Sultan that he gave a prospective pilgrim to Mecca La Panouk a sealed permit. And on the 22nd of, um, of that month, the pilgrim took his departure for Mecca. Now, the diaries are written in Bugis, but they're in Bugis language and script, which reads from left to right. But occasionally you find words in Arabic. So you can actually see the word Hajj here on the 17th and oh, it starts Alhamdulillah and Al Hajj. Um, and so Hajj here in the entry for the 22nd. Now this manuscript, like many other Royal Bonnet diaries, which are now held in the British Library in London, are part of the Royal Library of Bonnet, which was captured by the British in an attack on the court of Bonnet in 1814 and entered the collection of John Crawford. So John Crawford was an East India Company official 
who is fluent in Malay and Javanese and who's writing a book on the history of South, on, on Southeast Asia, the Malay world of Southeast Asia. But he did not know Bugis. So he commissioned Malay translations of important entries from the Bonet diaries. And this is um, an extract from one of the Malay manuscripts which he had commissioned as translations from the Bonet diaries. And this is an interesting account of a visit to the court of Bonet in 1806 by an honored guest from Mecca, Ibrahim, Ibrahim Zain al Abidin, who reports on the Wahhabite at actions and attacks in Mecca and Medina, demolishing venerated tombs, demolishing everything save for the tomb of the prophet himself. And so we do see how the royal courts in the Malay world acted as <clears throat> points for the exchange of information from the outside world through the traveling and the coming forth and back of visitors. Malay rulers also played a very important role um, in that they were instrumental in negotiating passages for prospective pilgrims to Mecca on visiting foreign ships including ships of the East India Company. And so this was one of many letters to Francis Light, um, who was the, um, at the time, still just a British East India um, country trader working with the East India Company before, before, this is before the settlement of Penang by the East India Company. So this is a letter from the Sultan of Selangor on the west coast of, um, of the Malay Peninsula, asking for Francis Light's help in organizing passage for a prospective Hajj pilgrim on a ship to Bengal from where, you know, he could take another ship and eventually make his way through to the Middle East. Those who were unable to make the pilgrimage themselves in their lifetime would sometimes hope to be able to gain the benefit for, by leaving money in their wills for others to undertake the pilgrimage on their behalf as a proxy pilgrimage. And there are a number of um, wills in the Malacca records in the British Library, which leave, which leave funds specifically for this purpose. So this is um, a will from Malacca dated 1814 of a woman, a, a wealthy woman called Zainia, who leaves funds and asks, she appoints as her executor and chit run to, or Ranta, and she leaves money for seven pilgrimages to be carried out, firstly on her own behalf, secondly for her mother, and she names um, five other relatives, one presumes, for whom funds um, should be, will be paid if proxy pilgrimages can be carried out on their behalf. And she also instructs her executor to sell a house in Malacca in order to establish an endowment, a wakf, wakf in, um, in Mecca for the benefit of poor pilgrims. Now, there was a, this was a centuries old tradition of establishing in Malay rumah wakf, so charitable hostelries in Mecca, for the benefit of pilgrims from specific parts of Southeast Asia often endowed by the ruler or rich patrons from the region. And such rumah wakaf are often mentioned in Malay chronicles and other texts. So this is um, a manuscript of the genealogy of the rulers of Brunei, the Sil Sila Raja Raja Brunei. And the author of this text um, was the Khatib of Brunei, um, Khatib al Hajj Abdul Latif. And the see, he was the senior Islamic official of the, of the realm. And he makes it clear that he personally made the pilgrimage to Mecca in 1806 and purchased a house to endow in Mecca. And in his anthology um, on the Hajj, Henri Chamberlois also gathered sourced, sources referring to Ruma Wakaf established in Mecca for the benefit of pilgrim, pilgrims, specifically from Aceh, from Pontianak, from Lankat in East Sumatra. So these are all Ruma Wakaf which were established by either the rulers or rich people from those particular regions to benefit pilgrims from those regions. Now, the modern age of the Hajj um, really began in the early 19th century with the introduction of the steamship, which greatly shortened journey times from Southeast Asia to Arabia. 
And at this point, I'd like to introduce a very important name, um, Abdullah bin Abdul Qadir Munchi from Malacca, who is one of the most famous and influential Malay writers of the 19th century. He was a very original and um, perceptive observer of a swiftly changing world, who was quick to embrace new technologies and new world views. He was a professional scribe from a young age, his father was also a scribe, and as a youth he learnt the new art of printing from Christian missionaries in Malacca. He's also been termed the first Malay journalist because of his eyewitness style of writing. He wrote about what he saw around him, which is quite a different style of writing from that found in most Malay writings of the period. So as can be seen in this little piece that he wrote, which was printed in, um, this was um, first printed in, 19, in 1841, this is the second edition of 1843, of the, the Chutra Kapal Asap, the story of the steamship. And this describes his visit to a steamship which came into Singapore in 1841. He went aboard it and he um, wrote of his amazement at everything he saw on board that ship. After a lifetime of working and, write, and writing the first Malay autobiography, Abdullah himself embarked on a steamship to undertake the Hajj to Mecca in 1854. And true to character, he wrote a long record of his journey, but, and he writes in, of his rapture at his sight of the holy city. But shortly after arriving in Mecca, he fell ill and he died there. And his account of the journey was only um, published posthumously in 1850. He died in 1854 and in 1858, it was published in, um, the, it's called the Kisa Palaya and Ab Abdullah, the voyage of Abdullah to Mecca. And it was published in the missionary journal, um, Chermin Mata, um, published by Benjamin Keysbury in 1858. So Abdullah had written of his the difficulties of his long voyage and the terrible weather and that the all the pilgrims thought they were going to die if the ship sank. Um, but in fact, others faced on the pilgrimage or faced more overtly hostile treatment. So this is a document which is held in the Ottoman archives in Istanbul, which was um, discovered through the recent um, British Academy project Islam um, Trade and Politics Across the Indian Ocean, about which we'll be talking in a few days time. Um, this is um, a petition addressed to the Ottoman governor of the Hijaz, which is sealed, there's the seals of 63 pilgrims from Aceh and Karinchi in Sumatra, protesting at their treatment by the Dutch and asking for action to be taken. Now it's very interesting with this use of seals because in the Malay world, the use of seals was reserved for royalty and court officials only. Ordinary people didn't have seals. We know that because um, Munshi Abdullah in his autobiography was commissioned to design a seal for a newly ennobled court official. But Abdullah himself prepared his will before he set off on the Hajj, and even his own will is not sealed. And that really shows that ordinary people who are not court officials did not have or use seals. But in other parts of the Islamic world, such as in the Ottoman world, in, in India, in Egypt, everybody at every level of society had a seal and needed it for, to transact any official business at all, such as a petition. And so the fact that all the seals on this petition look alike, and here's one you can blow up, and they're all dated 1289, the same date, implies that these seals were all made by the pilgrims on arrival in the Hijaz. And they're made according, and they're very Ottoman in, um, in style, in calligraphy, and in shape, and, 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 and in form. And so they had seals made on arrival in order to submit an official petition um, according to established Ottoman government protocol. Now, as the number of pilgrims to Mecca increased with easier and shorter journeys, they needed guides and maps to help them prepare their journey. This is a very rare manuscript um, map of Mecca um, produced in Aceh. And on the back of it, we have a long text in Achenese describing Mecca and describing um, all the rituals of the Hajj linked to the, ex ex um, linked to the, to the exact um, monuments. 
Um, this is probably late um, eight, 19th century, around maybe 1860s, 1870s, um, only about three decades later, but seemingly from a much more recent period, is this small guide in Malay on the Hajj. Um, it's a guide for the, it, written in Malay for pilgrims, which was printed using typeset, um, um, pre a typeset press in Singapore in 1900. Um, when the pilgrims arrived in Mecca, they were usually um, taken charge of by a number of sheikhs who each, who each had responsibility for pilgrims from different parts of the, the world. So these are two of the sheikhs for the Malay pilgrims in Mecca, photographed by Snook, by Christian Snook Hugronje, who is a name which is very, it is a name which is intimately associated with Mecca. Um, Snook Hugronje was a Dutch scholar who converted to Islam and visited Mecca in 1884, and was the first person to take photographs um, of Mecca and to, he wrote a book on Mecca, which is, um, with which he paid particular attention to pilgrims from Southeast Asia. So it's a really um, valuable source for the experience of pilgrims in Southeast Asia at that time. He also photographed many groups of pilgrims from different parts of um, present-day Indonesia, the Malay world, um, at the Dutch consulate in Jeddah. Um, and he describes in his fascinating book that pilgrims from the Malay world often had a particularly difficult time in Mecca while on the Hajj because they were cheated and picked upon mercilessly. And this is because it was generally known that they couldn't speak Arabic. And because they had come from such long journeys and so many of them were carrying money either for the needs of their journeys or to carry out these proxy pilgrimages on behalf, they were given commissions by relatives and others. Um, the, the, um, the sharks knew that they had funds and because their understanding of Hajj rituals was so limited, often unscrupulous locals would make up fake rituals and charge um, them for the charge the, the pilgrims for the um, undertaking of these um, extraneous um, rituals. On their return to Southeast Asia, of course, the pilgrims were welcomed home with great, um, with great pomp. And even to the present day, these are pictures uh, from contrasting you know, a century apart in Surabaya in the 1880s, setting off on the next leg of the return journey to the K Islands in Maluku. And the top picture is from Brunei in the 1970s with a ceremonial arch welcoming a pilgrim back from the Hajj. When pilgrims returned, of course, they brought back souvenirs and mementos. Zam Zam water to the present day would always be carried. But some of these souvenirs were much more high end. For example, in the richest pilgrims might be able, might be lucky enough to get a piece of the kiswa. And this is a very fine um, jacket made but for one of the Patani royalty, um, princes of the royal family in um, southern Thailand. Um, pilgrims also brought back um, certificates and maps of the Holy Land. You can see that in the tropical conditions of Southeast Asia, these have these were greatly treasured, even if they didn't always um, they didn't they weren't always um, didn't survive over the years so well. So this is a is a copy of a map from brought back from Mecca, which was it's held in a private collection in Kerinci in province of Jambi in central Sumatra and was only digitized in 2007. So it was at least um, at least 100, maybe 140, 50 years old but at that time. And other typical souvenirs that were that were brought back were um, talismanic charts and of course books and manuscripts such as copies of the Quran. And at this point, I'd like to ask, um, so what impact did Ottoman arts have on the book arts of the Malay world after so many centuries of contact? And particularly, the contact was mostly through the melting point of Mecca. That there might have been some contact with Istanbul, but mu much more often was contact through um, the, the cities of the Haramain in, in, in Arabia. We certainly have evidence of some a few Malay calligraphers and artists in Mecca who were studying in the Ottoman style. 
So one of the finest examples known is a prayer book, a kitab maulid, which is now held in the um, Islamic Arts Museum, Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur. And it was, it's, I mean, it's copied in superb Ottoman style calligraphy and illuminated in an Ottoman style. But the name of the scribe is Ibrahim of Hulusi al Sumbawi. A Sumbawi, so from Sumbawa in eastern, in present day eastern Indonesia. Although this prayer book is not fully um, dated, what is very important, and it's also held in the Islamic Arts Museum in Malaysia, is a letter in Malay with quite a lot of Arabic from somebody called Abdurrahman from Kelantan. This is his seal, it's blown up here, his seal is Abdurrahman. And he writes in this letter to the Sultan of Pontianak. He's, he's writing from Mecca, and he says that he is state he is studying Ottoman calligraphy. He's studying Manurat Stumble. He's st studying how to write in the Istanbul style, and he names as his teacher the late Ibrahim Al Hulusi. So this, so he was studying with this scribe, the scribe who wrote this prayer book. So we do know that there was a little coterie of Malay scholars studying Ottoman calligraphy. Um, this is in the in the um, the Sultan's Mosque, the Masjid Sultan, on the island of Penyengat um, in the Riau Islands, just south of Singapore. Um, and it's held in the mosque. There is a very fine Quran, illuminated Quran, and the explanation label states that it was written by um, Ab, somebody called Abdurrahman Stambul. I don't think it's not the same as the previous one who's from Kelantan because this one came from the island of Linga and he was sent by the government of Linga to Cairo to study Ottoman calligraphy and it's um, called, um, so it mentions here, um, Gaya study Khat Gaya Istanbul. So this um, Quran is said to be by his hand. And yet, um, I think it would be quite important to have the opinion of an expert on Ottoman calligraphy to state um, whether this hand is indeed rec recognizably influenced by, in, by an Ottoman style or not. Because from the aspect of illumination, um, it's a very typically Malay Quran in the East Coast style strongly influenced by the art of Tringani on the East Coast. So in fact, um, to be honest, what is perhaps surprising is that it's quite rare to find clear um, examples of Ottoman inspired um, calligraphy in the Malay world. Much more common is the continuation of traditional um, calligraphic and decorative styles associated with regional traditions from the Malay world, which continue to be practiced even in Mecca itself. So here are two examples of typically Malay um, illuminated manuscripts, which were actually produced in Mecca at a time when it was under Ottoman governance, which none, and, but these manuscripts are produced in a purely Southeast Asian idiom. So at the top, we have um, a manuscript in, in Malay called Kitab Hikam, which is decorated in the Achenese style. This is a typically Achenese um, headpiece, and it was copied in 1855 in the um, Ruma Ache. So it's one of these Ruma Wakaf, it's a hostel for the Achenese pilgrims in Mecca. And here below, we have um, a manuscript beautifully illuminated in the Tringanu style, but it was copied in Mecca in 1874 by a Patani scribe, but it's written in Mecca. So we, we, we note that this, this ambivalence of um, we, that there is Ottoman influence and there were Malays who went to Mecca to study in Ottoman style, but the deep attachment to um, their own traditions um, from the evidence of manuscripts exerted a stronger influence. But we also know that perhaps notice that perhaps it's the fact that even in Mecca that the Southeast Asians, the Malays, tended to congregate together and to stay in their own communities um, in their Ruma Wakaf, which perhaps um, provided a suitable environment for the continuation of their own traditions. 
However, one aspect of manuscript art, which even if manifested in a local artistic idiom, was probably introduced into the Malay world through an intermediary Ottoman lens, is the illustrations in copies of the very popular prayer book, Dalail al Khairat, which, is, um, which was a prayer book composed um, by, the, by a Moroccan writer, Al Jazuli, in the 15th century. And these prayer books typically contain illustrations of the tomb of the prophet and um, his companions of Bakr and Umar in Medina in the prophet's mosque. And they are usually reproduced in a very stylized form of three rectangles um, in a slightly overlapping um, row. So this is an example from Selangor in the 18th century. Later copies of this prayer book usually balance um, depictions of Medina on the left hand side and you can still see the two, three tombs here with depictions of Mecca on the right hand page. So although this prayer book was composed in Morocco it became very popular in the Ottoman world and doubtless um, it, it spread into Southeast Asia through that Ottoman lens. And it's a very important prayer book in connection with the Hajj because these depictions of Mecca and Medina in the prayer book probably had a great impact on popular imagination, imagination and um, evoking the image of Mecca and Medina that was familiar in the Malay world. So this is a copy from probably from Patani on the east coast of the Malay Peninsula. There are other, um, many other copies known from Southeast Asia. This is a sumptuous copy, um, which is probably produced in Tringanu, very heavily gilded. Again, we can see the three tombs here and the mimba of the Prophet on the, in, from Medina on the left and the Kaaba in Mecca on the right. And this is um, a royal copy from Palembang. It, used, it belonged to one of the sultans of Palembang in the early 19th century. And this is quite unusual as these drawings are found not in the copy of the Dalai al Khairat, but it's there found in a Quran from Aceh. This is the only Quran manuscript known with these illustrations of Mecca and Medina in a Quran manuscript. But this is probably one of the finest examples known. It only has images from Medina. And so you have the tombs on the right hand page and the Mimba of the Prophet in a very stylized form on the left hand page. So this manuscript is was probably created in Patani or Kalantan in the either the late 18th probably or the early 19th century. Um, it's one of the most perfectly judged examples of Malay manuscript art and it was a, a source of great pride to find that this manuscript was included in the seminal exhibition at the British Museum in 2012 called Hajj, Journey to the Heart of Islam. And this was a section of the exhibition which was devoted to the Prophet's Mosque in Medina. And you see, so alongside an Ottoman textile which was made on the orders of Sultan Selim for the Prophet's Mosque in 1803, there's an exhibition case here with two massive brass candlesticks um, on loan from the Benaki Museum in Athens which were made by the 15th century Mamluk Sultan for the mosque in Medina in 1482. And there's a 17th century Turkish tile um, from depicting the sanctuary at Medina. Um, but in the middle is this small, beautiful Malay manuscript of the Dalai al-Khairat. And it was um, very, very significant for Southeast Asia because this is a region which is normally wholly neglected or relegated to the periphery in exhibitions or discussions on Islamic art. So to see a Malay illuminated manuscript in this exhibition, and indeed at the very heart of the world of Islamic art, was a really moving experience. And its presence here in this case also bore witness to the fact that for centuries, Malay pilgrims from Southeast Asia have been an integral part of the Hajj. So on that note, I'll end my talk. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this really, I mean, good and in detail presentation, Dr. Gallo. It was really informative. I mean, from the royalties to the ordinary people of the Southeast Asia, 
you shared many different and various images with us and told us a different story of Hajj maybe. It's the same story, but I mean, through the manuscripts, I mean, the old documents, it was really rich and colorful for us. Thank you. Maybe, I mean, there is uh, one question about your uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, you told us that the influence, artistic influence of the Ottomans actually in compared to the traditional one was, I mean, rare. I mean, mm -hmm. if we consider the regional differences, can we say that some regions in compared to the others were, I mean, uh, more uh, influenced by these, by the Ottoman artistic influences? Yes, um, I think the area which was most um, strongly influenced actually was the east coast of the Malay Peninsula, Tringanu, Patani, Kelantan, was much um, stronger. Um, you really don't see Ottoman influence at all in, in, strangely enough, in the manuscript art of Sumatra, even in Aceh, it's not evident at all. But you do see it um, quite strongly in, in Patani and, um, say, Tringanu, albeit reabsorbed into a Malay style. So there are a number of features. One is that they're in the page layout of the Quran. So there was an Ottoman um, model of how to of, to, of laying out a Quran manuscript, which, which was developed in the 17th century, which was a very clever system, which worked out that you could fit one juice of the Quran onto exactly 10 folios of paper, which is 20 pages. So you always had the first line of a new juice at the start of a, of a right-hand page. And on every page, there would always be a complete number of ayah, of verses. And this was especially um, good for memorizing the Quran by heart because you could picture, it was always on all manuscripts, you, the same amount of text was on each page. And this model is followed um, very um, accurately in all Qurans from Patani and Tringanu. You always find this Ottoman model of page layout. Um, so even when the style of decoration is um, Patani style, you would find that the model has been borrowed from the Ottomans. Now you don't find this in Aceh. So in Aceh, they just started to, to write the Quran and some people had bigger handwriting and some people had smaller. So the number of pages would vary. But in um, Tranganu and Patani Kalantan, you would always have exactly the same number of pages. Now, you see a little bit in Java. So sometimes the Ottoman model is absorbed in Java, sometimes not. Um, in the illumination also, there is, um, there is some um, awareness of Ottoman influence in Patani and Tranganu. <laughs> There is, um, you know, I can't, I, I can't speak Turkish, but there is a, a name for a particular, some, it's Tig, Tig, T-I-G. Um, it is a particular element of illumination where there's a small ray coming out from the um, illuminated frame. And it's, um, when you see it in some Malay style Qurans from the East Coast, it is done in blue or red ink. And th this is a very clear, um, it's Ottoman influence, very similar to you find, what you find in Ottoman manuscripts, because the Malay world tradition is not to draw in different colored inks, but always to use black ink for the outline. And then you put the colors in, um, and that's what you find in Arche or in Minangkabau, for example. But sometimes so the use of um, of, ray, of drawing rays in, in, in a pastel um, pigment. I think comes from the Ottoman style. So yes, there is more Ottoman style, but not where you'd expect it. You might expect it in Aceh, but it's not obvious in the book arts of Aceh. Thank you so much again for your time and this really good presentation, Dr. Gallo. And for our audience, I mean, the recorded version of this presentation will be available very soon with perfect subtitles as well. And again, uh, I mean, kind reminder for all the audience, Dr. Gallup will join us again on next Thursday for the uh, webinar on the project Islam Trade and Politics Across the Indian Ocean with Professor uh, Professor Andrew Peacock and Professor Ismail Akhtikade. And uh, we will have uh, Dr. Gallup's talk again on Thursday. Thank you for watching us. Thank you, Dr. Gallup, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Kay, Dr. 